I think we can start now. Great. Start now. So how much time would you like me to take, um, Anna? May uh, I think it might be one hour if you want, or one hour and uh, thirty minutes. I don't okay. Know. If it's it's okay for you. Great. Yes, and then um, we can leave some time for questions. Um, yes, yes. But yes, and also you know if uh, while I'm talking, if you have any questions. Um, uh, please feel free to jot them down on the chat screen, uh, maybe, because I am going to share um, uh, some slides, okay? And um, is my speed okay? Do I need to slow down or is this okay for everyone? It is fine. Uh, if, if you give, give us a short break, uh, we want to introduce you to our listeners. So okay. okay, sure. Absolutely, yes. Welcome to everyone. Uh, we are uh, IMNS, a student in Boğaziçi University, a Turkish Language and Literature Department. We are here to listen Mohan Dutta's open lecture on neoliberal policies, policies and uh, authoritarian regimes in universities, campuses. Uh, firstly, we want to introduce ourselves. Mm. Wait. Uh, Seyma, would you like to say something on who we yes. are? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Seyma, and I want to talk about who we are. We are a group of students. Uh, 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 we are a group of students from Boston University Turkish Language and Literature Department, and we arrange open lectures with the name of Free Literature in Turkish Serbestism. We want to gain our safe and free environment, and we consider these lessons as a first step. So why do we arrange open lectures? As you know, since the night of January 2, the undemocratic rector appointment threatens our safety, democratic and free environment. We care about democratic and free university, universities, and we want to support the resistance with the discipline of literature. We, as living in Turkey, and studying at Boston University now our constitutional rights. Therefore, we will continue to advocate our rights and we will resist. We won't be silent against undemocratic appointments, police harassments and violence, unjust attention and arrest. We aim to create an alternative and safe environment in which we can discuss freely and we want to keep our resistance active. Finally, we consider this rector, rector appointment as an attack against or our rights, culture, and autonomy. And we say we do not accept, we do not give up, and we never look down. Thank you. Now, uh, I guess our touch, uh, uh, talk about uh, what's going on. We will talk about what's going on in the campus and what we want. Yes, thank you. Here, Kubra is here for this speech. So, yes, Kubra, please go on. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Kubra. Uh, I am studying at the Boz, um, Turkish Language and Literature Department at Boz University. Uh, today, I will talk about the general state of the Boz University and our demands. Uh, contrary to the situation or tradition that academies, academics elected the rector after Mehmet Özkan was appointed as the rector of Boğaziçi University in 2016, the rector from outside was appointed to our university for the first time after the 1980s. Although we started from the first day, that we don't we do not want an appointed director or resistance which started which started with the ignoring of our demands continues to grow stronger from this first day despite all the police in, in intimidation in this process our, our university was put under police blockade or the professors 
were tried to be discredited through the media and unfair decision was made to close the Bu uh, LGBTI plus studios, studios club by the appointed director and GTUC, which is the Commission of Preventing Sexual Abuse, was deactivated by ending the coordinator's labor contract. Throughout this process, our friends who resisted, who resisted, who resisted injustice and reached a thousand were detained by battering. Some of them were even subjected to searches. Sorry. Some of them were even uh, subjected to strip searches. Hundreds of people were judged. Were uh, judged. Dozens of people were placed under home detention, and eleven of our friends were arrested. On another Friday night, two new faculties were opened without consult without consulting our professors to be staffed at our school. But none of these could break our resistance. They did not weaken us. On the contrary, they made us stronger. We believe that uh, we will emerge victorious from this difficult process without looking down and in solidarity. And we are walking together on this path. We gathered here to add another link to our chain of solidarity without losing our energy. We would like to express our gratitude uh, graduate, graduate to Mohan Dutta, who accepted our invitation on this precious evening. Finally, we want to repeat our justified demands once again. All appointed directors, especially Melih Bulu, must resign immediately. All our friends under home detention must be released. Yok, High Commission of Education, which is a, a cop institution, could be closed. The police who blockaded our campuses must leave the school. University rectors must be determined by the election that includes all components of universities, fundamental human rights, and all constitutional rights of all LGBTI pluses must be recognized. Must be recognized. LGBTI plus studies club, whose acti whose activities uh, whose activities were suspended in our school, must go into action again. We do not accept. We do not give up. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, saying this. And finally, I want to introduce Bir Mohan Dutta to all of you. Mohan J. Dutta is Dean's Chair, Professor of Communication. He is the Director of the Center for Culture-Centered Approach to Research and Evaluation, Developing Cultural Centered Community-Based Projects of Social Change, Advocacy, and activ Activism that Articulate Health as a Human Right. Mohan Dutta's research examines the role of advocacy and activism in challenging mar marginal marginalizing structures, the relationship between poverty and health, political economy of global health policies, the mobilization of cultural troops for the justification of neo-colonial health development projects, and the ways in which participatory cultural centered process and strategies of the radical Democracy survey as X of global social change. This is all I want to say. And thank you again for Mohan Dutta. And I think he can start here. Thank you so much for this um, invitation, um, Ines. And I want to thank you all for uh, joining me. I first just want to say how inspiring it is to be amidst you and in uh, solidarity with you and your uh, protests. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about 
um, bears testimony to the organizing work and the resistance work that you are doing on the ground in the face of um, um, the interplays of authoritarianism and uh, neoliberalism. So I offer this talk in solidarity. What uh, I will begin by doing is uh, sharing a screen just to um, uh, sort of draw out some of my main points. And uh, then I want to leave enough time for us to um, go through a question and answer session. So the way I have framed this uh, talk is by wanting to look at the intersections of authoritarianism and neoliberalism on university campuses. What I will uh, begin by doing is uh, set up the um, uh, framework for understanding what neoliberal transformations are and what they have looked like globally. Uh, then I will connect these to the neoliberal university. And in that part of the conversation, I will highlight the ways in which techniques of violence, all the way from uh, policing to militarization of university campuses, have been strategies of the neoliberal university. So that will then connect to the concept of authoritarian control and looking at the ways in which authoritarian control plays out in the neoliberal university, but in the broader state structure with the university being a part of that state structure. I then want to wrap up my part of the uh, lecture by uh, offering some radical imaginaries. So how can we imagine other possibilities that structurally transform the authoritarian and the neoliberal forces? Um, uh, in that, I will draw upon lessons in terms of um, uh, past resistance movements and ongoing resistance movements that we see across the globe on university campuses. But I will also then identify some strategies uh, that we might consider as entry points in sustaining uh, this work of resistance. Because as we all know, um, authoritarian power is entrenched in the neoliberal transformations in the university today. And it sustains itself through forces of the market being supported by privatized logics and um, uh, 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 privatized funding resources. In that sense, therefore, the power of uh, the authoritarian forces uh, need to be attacked and uh, challenged on a sustained basis. And I want to outline uh, toward the end what kinds of strategies of sustenance can we look at. In delivering this talk, I will draw upon my experiences uh, as an academic, but also uh, as an activist in humble ways, uh, both within the context of my work, um, uh, challenging the authoritarian structure in Singapore, uh, my work um, in uh, China and India, as well as my work in the US, and particularly in terms of um, trying to imagine what this space of dissent looks like um, in the midst of these forces of neoliberalism. So let's sort of begin by uh, doing a basic overview of the concept of neoliberalism and the ways in which it has organized our society. Um, in the backdrop of this particular slide, you see uh, the image of the landscapes and the spaces in which we live uh, today. Now, uh, this image is um, uh, an image of a particular place, but it is also a global image that we see across cultures when we look at um, the spaces in which we live. What you see on the uh, screen is a picture of an urban landscape where on one side of the picture, you have a spaces of living um, of the well-to-do, the um, upper classes and the upwardly mobile classes. And on the other side of the picture, you have uh, uh, those spaces uh, that um, are inhabited by uh, people who constitute the margins of our uh, societies. So this deep inequality, inequality in the organizing of spaces is, the fundamental feature of neoliberalism. 
And this inequality is cultivated through the logic of the free market that um, uh, fundamentally ties the market as the basis for solving our uh, problems. So uh, all forms of human life are turned into uh, commodities in the market such that they can be privatized. And we see this all the way from privatization of education to privatization of fundamental resources such as um, water and air. Um, of course, we have seen the, the strong effects of neoliberalism amidst uh, COVID-19, uh, particularly in terms of the ways in which COVID-19 has played out in our societies, um, in terms of who um, is able to uh, practice the uh, various um, uh, uh, prevention measures uh, that have been recommended uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and who is exposed to the pathways of COVID-19. Uh, we see it in terms of um, who bears the burdens of the policies um, uh, related to COVID-19, including loss of job, uh, loss of employment opportunities, uh, loss of um, uh, oh, opportunities to just sustain um, uh, themselves. So this broader picture is one where our societies have fundamentally been reorganized to serve the interests of privatized capital. So the logic of neoliberalism works on the operationalization of the free market. It um, uh, takes ideas such as uh, freedom and democracy and places them in the ambits of the market so that um, uh, the argument is that when you actually bring about uh, the market, you will bring about uh, freedom. So across the globe, and certainly, um, you know, um, across uh, regions outside of the hegemonic global north, that is uh, the semi-peripheries and peripheries of the globe, the organizing logic of the free market is the fundamental way in which our lives, our livelihoods, our ways of learning have been reorganized. And this has been done through ongoing individualization of our uh, lives, where uh, human beings have been turned into um, individuals who can attain um, uh, freedom and liberty through their participation in the logics of the market. So the only way to achieve freedom in that sense is through processes of participation in the free market. Now, the capacity of neoliberalism to um, co-opt and um, uh, incorporate transformative and resistive discourses is one of the fundamental features of its free market logic, such that um, concepts such as justice, concepts such as um, uh, equality, concepts such as diversity and inclusion have been incorporated into the overarching ideology of the market. Um, uh, th this process of incorporation is fundamental to the expansive logic of the market. Uh, note here that the market in neoliberalism exists to the extent that it can self-perpetuate, it can continue to perpetuate itself and create new spaces that it can bring under its control. And it, uh, so it, it, it is able to do so by the processes of cooptation that turn uh, values of liberty, freedom into individualized logics that are mediated through the market. So this process then uh, results in what in my work I talk about is the processes of commoditization through market platforms. And this includes commoditization of uh, resistance. So as um, uh, markets expand, uh, they do so through the power of platforms. And this forms uh, the basis of what we think of today as platform capitalism, which is uh, the incorporation of our participation as um, uh, free labor into the forces of the market in order to sustain the platforms. Okay, so um, if you uh, look at the uh, 
hegemonic forces of the market today and the largest global corporations, these are uh, technology corporations, these are platform corporations, um, uh, such as um, uh, Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So the logics of the market are uh, mediated through uh, platforms. So that uh, platforms such as uh, Facebook monetize our participation in order to serve the logics of uh, the market. So our participation as uh, free labor or unpaid labor drives the fund fundamental logics of um, uh, the platform. And this is a key point to note because uh, this has uh, important implications for resistance and how you sustain it. Uh, to the extent that uh, resistance to neoliberalism is um, uh, co-opted into platforms, it is worth noting that these platforms exist to profit and they profit from our participation. So uh, this, we see this process of um, uh, profiting from participation all the way from um, uh, the incorporation of logics of hate um, uh, to drive platform capitalism because um, uh, hate, um, the oppressive ideas, uh, they um, uh, draw um, eyeballs, uh, they draw people's participation and through that process, uh, they often uh, drive up uh, the um, uh, market logics of the platform, but also through the ongoing incorporation of uh, large scale movements where uh, platforms can co-opt these movements to serve their logics. So as these uh, processes of incorporation um, uh, take up uh, the vital elements of uh, neoliberal expansion across the globe today, uh, we see the depletion of public resources, uh, meaning that uh, resources that belong in the public, resources uh, that um, are funded uh, often through uh, taxpayer uh, monies are um, increasingly privatized or, in, or are increasingly incorporated into the logics of the market. A great example of this is the depletion of education and pedagogy as a public resource and the incorporation of learning and education to serve the ongoing logics of the market. Now, uh, this process of neoliberal transformation is um, so deeply invested um, and has so fundamentally colonized our educational processes globally that any form of um, uh, dissent or questioning or challenging of the market logics and the organizing logics of neoliberalism are framed as deviant, are framed as uh, threatening, as are framed as wastage of um, uh, resources. And this then becomes the basis for uh, the deployment of various strategies of disciplining. So this is a key point to remember. So as people uh, fight and resist to um, uh, keep their ownership of these public resources and to keep resources public, they are framed as um, deviants. They are framed as uh, security threats, which then becomes the basis for deploying the various strategies of disciplining. So uh, this process of um, uh, control and this process of transforming the public into private is at the heart of producing and reproducing inequalities, both within our own spaces, within nation states and um, across the globe um, in terms of uh, differences between the haves and have nots. So, uh, you know, one of the fundamental points to note here is that the neoliberal processes both work uh, globally and they work locally. So um, it is particularly worth attending to the workings of the neoliberal processes locally as they connect to the global processes in terms of uh, creating spaces for um, um, this kind of market uh, fundamentalism and legitimization of deep inequalities. Now, 
this also of course plays out through the ongoing attacks on marginalized identities that are uh, seen as threats to the logics of um, uh, neoliberalism uh, so uh, for instance if you look at uh, you know the repression of um, uh, rainbow or uh, transgender uh, communities um, uh, within uh, nation states and globally, you find that uh, the forms of attacks by these forces uh, that are organized work on two ways. On one hand, um, uh, they generate and produce uh, the notion of equity and diversity as market-friendly ideas. On the other hand, um, uh, to the extent that these identities become identities that threaten the market logics, they are pathologized, they are turned into pathologies, and then they are systematically attacked. A great example of this, you talked about um, the dismantling of um, uh, the spaces in Turkey in educational institutions that uh, served as sites for uh, challenging sexual violence in the academe. Now, uh, this is uh, something that you see across many parts of the globe. You know, in my work in Singapore, uh, in my work in India, I've seen this happen on an ongoing basis where uh, student-led and uh, staff and faculty-led uh, spaces of resistance to sites of sexual violence um, in the university have been attacked and dismantled on an ongoing basis. Now, you know, the point that is worth noting in this is that, that these forms of attack are also tied to uh, the logics of the market and the notions of uh, privatization, which is that uh, to the extent that uh, the mobilizing against um, uh, sexual violence on university campuses threatens the overarching logics of power and overarching uh, structures, uh, the uh, processes of disciplining are put into place in order to manage them. So, you know, the key point to note here is that um, the principles of market and commoditization and privatization actually exist side by side with strategies of repression. They exist together, although they are often framed as, um, um, uh, you know, the market is often framed as emancipatory. Uh, the market is often framed as, um, um, you know, something that will liberate our identities. Uh, but actually what happens uh, is that um, the logics of privatization are turned into the service of those in power. So uh, to the extent that identity-based movements, um, identity-based resistance actually challenges the hegemonic power configurations, that's when you see uh, the techniques of disciplining and repression at work. So this process of um, um, uh, co-optation of identities, identity-based resistance uh, to serve uh, the logics of the market on one hand, but on, at the same time to use techniques of disciplining is what is at the heart of the transformation of the state. So, you know, this is um, a, a feature of neoliberalism where the state has been reworked. It has been uh, fundamentally recaptured in order to serve the logics of the market. So market can expand, capital can expand only through the powers of the state that enable its expansion and see, and we see this as a key feature of um, um, authoritarian uh, neoliberalism across the globe, that um, uh, authoritarian techniques of control and repression are very much um, uh, fundamental to uh, the expansive logics of the market. They serve the expansive logics of the market, such that a global trans uh, transnational corporations, um, uh, uh, neoliberal forces that seemingly pr uh, 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 promote democracy turn the other way when we they see these authoritarian forms of repression because these authoritarian strategies actually are necessary for uh, carrying out the expansive logics of the market. We actually, when we look at the history of neoliberalism, we see uh, this play out at the birth of the neoliberal project in Chile. 
uh, which is, you know, when the neoliberal reforms were being introduced in Chile. And at that point, Chile had um, a democratically elected um, socialist government. Um, the uh, US supported, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Augusto Pinochet and the uh, military to organize a coup, which then brought about a dictatorship, which then introduced the massive neoliberal reforms in Chile. So uh, the birthplace of neoliberalism, where the neoliberal uh, experiment was first introduced and carried out, um, uh, 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 is tied to the logics of authoritarian control and uh, repression. You can see how that worked at that moment. So the organizing of violence and violence as a feature of power and control, violence as a way to enact its power and control is um, really vital to the neoliberal project. Neoliberalism needs violence in order to sustain itself. And this violence is normalized through the incorporation of the police and military. So uh, uh, that you know, um, uh, academic campuses, for instance, that otherwise seem perfectly friendly to the logics of the market uh, that uh, want to privatize things and create uh, new opportunities for mobility uh, can quickly turn into using techniques of disciplining, uh, deploying the police on students um, uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, serve the logics of power. So you know, th this point I think is important to remember that uh, violence is organized and uh, incorporated as a fundamental uh, strategy in the privatizing academy and in the privatizing state. So now let's look at how the academia has been transformed across the globe uh, through these neoliberal forces. You have um, uh, this image of um, um, a student, you know, uh, working as a delivery uh, uh, driver. Um, now, this, these kinds of images you see across the globe, where um, you know students have been fundamentally precarized. They live in precarity. Um, uh, teachers and professors live in precarity as um, academe generates profits for an elite class of administrators, uh, managers, and uh, privatizing forces. So uh, this transformation of the academe has been organized through uh, the centering of free market fundamentalism as a feature of academia, where uh, the logics of the free market have been deployed on an ongoing basis to deplete uh, state funding, uh, to privatize research uh, such that research itself is um, prioritized in the service of capital. So particular forms of research, the particular forms of academic work are more valued compared to other forms. So this you see in terms of the deployment of an ideology that says that there are the useful subjects uh, to do research on and to study. And then there are the useless subjects. And this process of commoditization on uh, what is practical, what is useful, works on this principle of market fundamentalism. That is, that what is it that will enable the market to expand and for the privatizing logics to expand uh, themselves. So as a state funding has depleted and research has been privatized, um, academe has also been enclosed, meaning that uh, the public role of academia has been enclosed um, uh, to the uh, funding dictates of um, uh, hegemonic structures and market forces. Simultaneously, we see the privatization of teaching with um, uh, teaching often being um, uh, farmed out to uh, digital platforms and to techno capital. So teaching is often mediated through uh, technology-based uh, large corporations uh, that uh, you know, uh, 
fundamentally perform those functions of teaching uh, through the monetization of the teaching tasks. And even as that has happened, uh, we see the precarization of university workers. So, uh, you know, academics, uh, staff have been rendered precarious, often working on short term contracts, often without labor rights. And that's a really important point uh, to remember is the ways in which um, unions and forms of collective organizing at universities have been attacked such that um, uh, staff can be uh, fired uh, at any point of time because they live on contracts. So this contractual or contract based um, employment of staff in universities is a key feature of the neoliberal um, university. And then this is tied to the tremendous influence of donors on universities, such that um, uh, as university funding that is public has depleted, what we see globally is the influence of private funders and private forces uh, to shape the research and teaching processes in universities. Now, what this also means, and this is an important thing to remember, is that this is a phenomenon that is happening globally. So even as we are talking about this in Turkey, um, um, consider how this is playing out in India right now with an authoritarian, almost a neo-fascist regime in power that uses uh, these kinds of privatizing forces to attack institutions in India. Or consider similarly what is happening in the US with large universities where, uh, you know, uh, for instance, um, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, the BDS movement in solidarity uh, with Palestine has often been uh, pathologized and turned into um, um, uh, a space that can be repressed through the influence of donors. And often that influence being enacted through privatized logics that are opaque so that the influence of the donor is not visible to an outsider. Or for that matter, it is not visible to staff and students in the university. So say for instance, uh, the donor influence on hiring, who gets hired, um, uh, the influence of trustees and uh, governing um, uh, uh, directors on uh, who actually gets to um, uh, be placed in certain positions how that hiring takes place. Um, depleting fundamental democratic processes often takes place under um, um, opaque screens. So the kind of struggle that you're talking about in terms of the appointment of the rector without public consultation and without the consultation of the necessary bodies, including students and staff, is a feature of neoliberal organizing of the university globally such that we increasingly see the loss of um, um, academic participation, uh, the loss of democratic participation in university processes as these logics are put forth to serve uh, efficiency, to serve uh, um, uh, market purposes. So, um, uh, you know, the language that is put forth is that um, this new rector was put in place or this new vice chancellor has been put in place uh, in order to make the uh, university more efficient, in order to bring in more funding, in order to uh, generate more resources and revenues, in order to discipline the university. Often you will hear the narrative that the university had gone haywire, so that democratic processes needed to be put into place in order to manage it and bring it back into control. So the question is in control for whom? And um, the answer to that is that it is in control to serve the logics of power, the logics of capital and the logics of the state that serve the interests of capital. And through this whole process, then uh, students have both been commoditized and precarized. And that's a really important point I want to bring up. Uh, the commoditization of student works through, first of all, individualization so that students are led to believe that as consumers of learning as product, uh, they can demand um, uh, particular outcomes out of their learning through their participation as consumers in the marketplace. So student participation 
as a consumer in the form of teaching evaluations, um, in the form of um, uh, 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 participation on platforms as welcome, and that is monetized. At the same time, uh, student participation that challenges the structures, student participation that wants democracy, uh, student participation uh, that um, uh, wants to have a say in the decision-making processes is pathologized, is turned into um, uh, a, a threat to security of the university, and therefore it's surveilled and attacked. So, uh, you know, this process of the commoditization of students is made to feel empowering on one hand, uh, while on the other hand, it actually works to take power away from students and turn them into a precarious class themselves, um, who are at the mercy of the powerful forces in the university uh, that serve the interests of capital. So, you know, th this logic of empowerment, it is really important to unpack because um, it is fundamental to the uh, loss of um, uh, the capacity of students to dissent. Um, and it is fundamental to the uh, techniques of disciplining that have been deployed on students. So all of this is held together through platform capitalism. That is uh, that um, uh, platforms work at sites of incorporation. Remember, I. Uh, shared with you about the processes of individualization and commoditization. And that takes place through platforms, with platforms working uh, to incorporate participation to serve uh, the logics of capital. So academe as a whole has been consolidated on the platform. Uh, this is all the way from research and the generation of knowledge, uh, which is now entirely platform based. Uh, so if you think about the emergence of platforms such as academia.edu or uh, ResearchGate, you know, these uh, serve as uh, structures that consolidate our participation under the language of openness in order to serve their own logics while continually uh, sending us signals about how we could be, uh, be, be better laborers, uh, and of course, albeit precarious laborers, but better laborers to serve not our interests, but the interests of the platform. So it's, it's you know, what is really interesting is that as we monitor our emails and uh, check the number of nudges we are sent, sent out about how we are doing, how we are performing, and all that sounds so good and empowering, but that actually supports the privatizing logic of the platform. Now, you know, for radical resistance, then it is important to think through uh, the capacity of resistance on platforms and how you sustain yourself recognizing that these platforms fundamentally exist uh, to profit from participation. And you also see this in uh, platform based uh, modes of teaching and learning where um, the, the commoditization of participation as platforms in uh, teaching has meant that um, uh, students and teachers have been monetized as um, uh, labor uh, in the delivery of the platforms and in the uh, uh, in expanding the reach of the platforms. These platforms at the same time work as sites of surveillance and as technologies of surveillance. You know, uh, I can reflect upon you know my own organizing work in Singapore and um, uh, you know, sharing how often I was under surveillance by the state, um, all the way from monitoring my Twitter and my uh, Facebook accounts uh, to monitoring my uh, conversations. And um, uh, you know, the key thing here is that the state had organized uh, multiple people within the structure through the production of uh, precarity to actually do the surveillance work. So uh, today, most um, academic institutions, for instance, have social media managers and um, uh, risk managers that are monitoring your participation, that are monitoring who is going on Twitter, who is going on Facebook, who is posting what, um, and actually gathering that kind of large scale data in order to monitor dissent and spaces of dissent. Now, this process of monitoring and surveillance is integral to building the reputation and ranking 
of neoliberal academia. So, you know, the global um, the growth of platforms such as Times Higher Education or QS uh, that offer rankings as the basis for organizing universities is tied to the mechanisms of surveillance and reputation, uh, such that uh, risk management, uh, uh, reputation management, these are now uh, paid functions and paid professional jobs in universities. So uh, note here that um, even as um, uh, academic jobs, uh, jobs of staff have been precarized and turned into precarious labor, um, there has been funding that is directed into reputation and rankings management and the surveillance functions. And um, uh, the surveillance functions work such that they can produce the kinds of metrics that can earn you reputation and rankings, such that you can have um, uh, universities in repressive um, authoritarian contexts. You know, I can think of universities in Singapore, for instance, you know, where uh, various forms of academic repression are used on the university that are ranked, um, you know, in the top 30 universities on the globe uh, by times. So, uh, you know, you know, one of the questions if you ask is that how can a university where you don't have academic freedom be ranked so highly in these uh, global matrices? Part of that is because of the nature of platform uh, capitalism and the nature of metric based uh, reputation management, this work of reorganizing the university actually can produce the kinds of metrics that can lead to um, academic excellence while fundamentally carrying out repression. So all of this then forms the basis of the kinds of authoritarian control that we are seeing across um, universities. And of course, this forms the backdrop of uh, the student protests globally, which is, uh, uh, you know, the university management has become uh, instruments of the state. University management uh, exists as uh, functions of or arms of state control and management, where they frame any dissent as incivility. So the language of civility is often used to um, pathologize dissent. Dissent is framed as a threat to security of the university and the state. And uh, these two processes of framing dissent as incivility and as security threat then work to silence dissent. So ultimately on university campuses, you find that entire uh, professional uh, teams of reputation managers working alongside uh, the police and the state apparatus are put in place in order to manage uh, the security threats of the university. Uh, so that students, for instance, are demanding that um, uh, there be infrastructures for addressing sexual violence on the university campus or uh, staff or professors demanding that there be infrastructures for addressing sexual violence for university structures are framed as um, a dissenting, as threat to the university. You know, in uh, the work of the center I direct care when working in Singapore, one of the key areas of work that um, uh, we had um, uh, sort of built on was on sexual violence on university campuses and seeking to build an infrastructure on university campuses uh, that address sexual violence. And um, that work quickly, as you are seeing in your um, instances, uh, got framed as a dissenting work, as a threat to security of the university, and as work that creates problems. So this idea that to demand for justice or to demand for um, uh, the rights um, is um, actually a threat to the structure of the university then raises a fundamental question that if a university, which is an academic institution, is threatened by um, the demand for uh, justice against sexual violence, then what is the kind of university that we are inhabiting? You know, um, and, 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 and what is the organizing logic of the university that sees uh, the articulation of voice uh, demanding uh, rights as threat to the security structure of the university. So this is the process through which uh, dissent is pathologized. Uh, professors are continually framed as um, uh, spoiling the students. 
So uh, professors are uh, categorized as the good professors and the bad professors and the ones uh, that uh, teach about uh, notions of rights, notions of uh, democracy and democratization, um, uh, notions of uh, uh, socialist futures are framed as pathologies and um, uh, that becomes the way in which then the repression is carried out all the way from um, uh, uh, firing people from their jobs to incarcerating them. Uh, just as we are speaking at this point in India, since the um, um, arrival of Narendra Modi, who uh, is actually similar to um, Erdogan and um, Bolsonaro. So, you, you know, usually in the global scale, you put them on the same kind of scale in terms of uh, their strategies of uh, repression put into place. So when Modi came to power in India, he carried out similar kinds of ongoing attacks on universities, often removing vice chancellors of universities and then placing uh, vice chancellors that would serve his political agenda and fundamentally undermining the democratic processes um, in universities. Now, when students and uh, staff and professors uh, stood up in dissent, that dissent was quickly pathologized. It was uh, framed as anti-national, as against the interests of the nation. So that concept of security threat is really key and how the trope of who is the anti-national is deployed. So anyone that is demanding for rights or democratic processes is um, uh, framed as anti-national. And that became the basis for incarcerating without trial multiple academics. So as we speak now, over uh, 30 academics um, in India are in jail without uh, proper trial uh, because they have been framed as threats to security. So, um, uh, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that, that this kind of repression that you're experiencing in Turkey is um, um, aligned with the kinds of repressions that we see elsewhere and certainly in authoritarian regimes such as Singapore, where that repression is worked into the strategies of the state so that it actually is invisible as it does its work. And this becomes uh, sort of how academic freedom is attacked on an ongoing basis through the strategies of surveillance. So, I want to wrap up this part of the talk by making a basic argument that authoritarian strategies of control are intertwined with, linked with, work alongside strategies of neoliberal expansion. So neoliberalism, although it frames itself as the market liberating the individual, um, it actually needs these authoritarian strategies in order to expand itself. And simultaneously, authoritarians need the forces of the market and privatization in order to sustain themselves. So we need to look at the ongoing interplay of the private and the state forces as they seek to silence and repress. In this backdrop then, and this is an image I uh, took from uh, the context of your protests to uh, make the argument that in this backdrop, what we see is the erasure of communicative equality, you know, which uh, sort of is what I've been concerned with in my own work, which is, you know, if you think about it uh, in terms of voice and the ability of uh, students, academics, those are the margins of citizens uh, to express their voices. It's about equality in the ownership of resources, of uh, sharing and disseminating information, uh, uh, of representing oneself. So uh, the rights of uh, rainbow communities, of trans uh, people uh, to represent themselves, uh, to demand for human rights, uh, resources for decision-making such as who will be the rector of the university and resources for boys. So uh, the struggle against um, neoliberalism and authoritarianism is one for generating equality. It is a struggle for equality. And the question is, how do we create or how do we build registers for equality in the ownership of these fundamental communicative resources? So it is only through communicative equality can we sustain these processes of change? Therefore, in that sense, we have to think beyond the logics of platform capital. 
Although, you know, in a lot of my own organizing work as an activist, I've found uh, uh, digital platforms like Facebook and Twitter uh, play important roles in uh, sort of building networks and building um, uh, spaces for articulating voices and creating registers. It also is important to remember that these are um, uh, platform capital, that they are embedded in the logics of capital. We certainly saw this in Arab Spring in terms of uh, the ways in which uh, the digital platforms were invested in um, extending their own reach and creating markets. And uh, when it came down to serving their own interests, they were quick to turn the surveillance data into the hands of the state. So Facebook is not your ally. Facebook will uh, share your data with uh, uh, the uh, repressive structures when it becomes convenient for its market logic. So this point is important to remember when you think about this question of communicative equality and really ask what are, when we are organizing dissent, what are the communicative infrastructures we own? And um, uh, what are the spaces that we own where we can articulate our voices? So this forms the basis of the concept of communicative and community sovereignty. To be sovereign is to be uh, independent. You know, in a lot of indigenous uh, struggles across the globe, the idea of sovereignty uh, uh, turns into the ownership of the spaces where one's voice could be heard. So um, uh, how then can we uh, build registers for communicative sovereignty where uh, sort of we can own um, the academics, um, the students, uh, staff can own the resources for voice, for information, and for uh, decision making. So that um, you know, you can imagine a future where uh, student participation and um, uh, staff participation actually shapes who is uh, recruited as a rector into the university. So these voice infrastructures then I see as fundamental to challenging the repressive capacities and techniques of disciplining of the state. Um, and because these voice infrastructures are surveilled on an ongoing basis, uh, this is where creativity is necessary in sustaining movements, particularly so because movements as they pick up momentum, they tend to be co-opted by platform capital to serve its own agendas. Um, it is important to think through how do you maintain the radicalism, uh, the transformative potential of voice infrastructures by sustaining them. How do you, for instance, you know, we see here uh, in the backdrop an image of police violence in the context of the COVID-19 lockdowns where uh, that violence is legitimized as a necessary strategy um, of repression in order to produce uh, security and safety for all. So how then do we build registers where we can speak up against uh, this kind of police violence knowing that that act of speaking up is going to be pathologized knowing that that act of speaking up is going to be uh, surveilled and is going to be turned into a security threat. So I will now talk about specific strategies. Um, fundamental to the work of building those voice infrastructures is to create infrastructures of listening. It is only when we can build uh, infrastructures of listening in hegemonic structures can we disrupt them can we uh, disrupt their dominant ideologies and their uh, dominant organizing of society, politics, economics to serve the interests of the powerful. It is through the making impure of those dominant categories of freedom, liberty, of exposing the ironies and the paradoxes, of exposing uh, the co-optations can we build the infrastructures of change. And what is important to these processes of change, therefore, is to build registers for critical reflexivity. Critical reflexivity is to critically interrogate and continually examine the workings of power. How is power working? Where is power silencing? Where is power co-opting? Uh, critical reflexivity can be a way for also interrogating power within movements so that uh, movements are ongoingly looking at the ways in which they might be or they are being co-opted and um, examining how they 
can then retain that space of voice and of authenticity where they can continue to challenge these structures. So now when these structures uh, speak up, as you are seeing in the context of um, uh, your own organizing work, uh, the structures will repress. The structure knows to repress and it has strategies of repression. So we should not be surprised in that sense when structures repress. Uh, the question is rather, how do we prepare ourselves for those strategies of uh, repression? I wanted to outline some of the ways in which structures repress, repress all the way from directly using violence, as you are seeing in uh, Turkey, uh, to threats of violence. You know, this is what will happen to you or you will lose your job, or you will lose your scholarship. Uh, we see those kinds of strategies of indirect threats often being used, or you will not get a recommendation letter, or you would not be employable. Um, there are also strategies of co-option, you know, attempting to co-opt um, the movement or attempting to co-opt spaces of dissent uh, by performing dialogue. Oh, we are listening to you. Let's have a dialogue. And that often can become a strategy for co-option. Uh, manipulation and strategies of manipulation are often used to delegitimize. So in the context of Singapore, for instance, you know, with the sexual violence work, when the students organizing against sexual violence and creating campus-based groups um, uh, to advocate against sexual violence became vocal and visible, that university created a structure to address sexual violence, but it did so uh, by not inviting the student activists that were actually doing the organizing work and by making them invisible. Uh, so that is uh, um, also a strategy of the structure where the structure might create something uh, that might look like it is responding to the protests and to the demands only to actually divert attention away and to weaken the power of the movement. So manipulation is an ongoing strategy of the structure. Uh, the structure also uses stigmatizing campaigns, you know, stigmatizing those that protest. And this often takes place um, in the form of individualized attacks. You know, in, um, in my own work uh, within the context of Singapore, uh, resisting its authoritarian structures, you know, I have been labeled many things, for instance, you know, all the way from uh, misappropriating funds or uh, financial irregularities, because, you know, my center was working with uh, transgender activists, you know, and it had um, uh, hired transgender activists as workers in the center. So for the university, that was the misspending of funds. So universities will use those kinds of strategies to stigmatize. Uh, students similarly that are protesting or activists that are dissenting will be stigmatized as anti-national in order to remove them from the spaces of conversation. And this then becomes the basis for legislation. So laws are often used and organized by authoritarian structures in order to solve this uh, structure. So India, for instance, has passed a series of laws that actually invoke the colonial era, the British colonial era laws in order to repress uh, dissent. You know, so we will uh, hear of sedition laws or anti-terror laws that are often uh, brought into place and put into action in order to silence dissent. So in this backdrop, this is my final slide, uh, we need to ask how do we build and sustain communicative infrastructures where dissent can articulate its voices and where uh, universities can agitate against this repression of academic freedom. Uh, so, you know, the, because communicative sovereignty is so important, um, uh, it's important to think through how you build communication infrastructures that you own. That this is at the heart of resistance movements, to be able to create multiple communicative infrastructures where you can participate safely and um, that you own in order to you know, create discursive registers and discursive um, articulations. Uh, creativity is really vital because of the ongoing strategies of um, uh, stigmatization and manipulation uh, that are carried out by authoritarian neoliberal structures. It's important to think through creative responses, um, uh, creative meanings and um, inputs in order to build communicative uh, registers. 
uh, support is vital and building support resources across spaces, just like how you're doing in terms of uh, building global solidarity networks and global support resources and uh, building multiple registers outside of the movements and um, um, organizing processes that can be mobilized in order to stand alongside uh, the struggle. Uh, building plural networks of solidarity. So uh, for student activists, it is organizing alongside workers who have been rendered precarious. It is uh, working alongside rainbow communities. Um, it's um, uh, working alongside uh, perhaps transgender sex workers who often face some of the most marginalizing forces of their structures. So those plural networks of solidarity, connecting identity-based and class-based movements, often these are pitted against each other. So, you know, the, the power really comes when you, for instance, connect um, a rainbow uh, based identity movements or uh, queer identity movements with uh, the movements of the working classes and the precarious classes. Attending to timing is really important in terms of how are you going to time the different communication activities uh, and that is connected with strategizing presence like when are you going to become visible? When are you going to go underground and be invisible? Um, you know, in my work, I talk about this notion of being like a mushroom, you know, a mushroom uh, just comes out and then it goes. So uh, thinking about when are you going to come out and articulate uh, publicly certain um, uh, uh, discursive articulations that challenge the structures, but when do you need to be invisible, be underground to do the organizing work? That timing is really uh, fundamental, and, and that then is connected to um, building multiple nodes for voice so that there are many different registers where voice is articulated and it doesn't fall on one individual or a small subset of individuals. Because a neoliberal authoritarianism works through individualization and the repression of the individual, the way to challenge that is through building collective solidarity and taking collective ownership. And this is the basis through which you build radical democracies in the everyday. You know, radical democracies are democracies where you can make claims to transformative structures that transform uh, this neoliberal onslaught and the authoritarian onslaught on our universities. And uh, to be able to make those claims, it is fundamentally about taking up and owning democracies and democratic processes all the way from who makes decisions on university campuses to who makes decisions in the nation state. And this is the basis for uh, what I you know, think of as socialist imaginaries because these are imaginaries anchored in communicative equality uh, to guide uh, the creation of an, another academe. Know this, and I want to wrap up by saying this, know that the organizing work that you're doing is inspiring. Uh, it is inspiring to so many across the globe because it. remember what I talked about multiple nodes. So if you think about your work as a node, it offers inspiration to activists and to students elsewhere, uh, to students in India, to students in Singapore, to students in the US about the possibilities of resisting authoritarianism. And similarly, perhaps these other movements elsewhere um, offer you a lesson that you're not alone in imagining these alternative registers. Uh, there are many others that are listening, witnessing, standing in solidarity with you. Thank you. Thank you for this great presentation and speech, dear Professor Dutta. And I think we can go on with uh, questions, but Kibra, is there any question that we can ask to Mohan Dutta? Uh, yes, I had a one. Mm, uh, the question is that many people who come to university campuses have problems uh, owing to uh, characterized uh, separation caused by their family. How does this separation uh, turn into another character? Uh, can we say that people who were raised in oppressive families uh, are much more resistant when they encounter authoritarian regimes in academia? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kubra. What a great question. You know, uh, 
that question that you point out, uh, um, you know, really draws us to this notion of multiple registers of uh, resistance, including recognizing that families are also sites of organizing, uh, disciplining, and uh, working through strategies of power and control. So, you know, I will then turn back Ubra, to the question of communicative equality and uh, to then the question, how can uh, uh, the necessary to dismantle these um, inequalities uh, within structures, whether it's state structures or academic structures, also connect with struggles within familial, um, intimate, romantic household contexts and rework um, our lives and ways of organizing. Um, but I also think that that process itself uh, perhaps is dialogic because there has to be an ongoing dialogue because families are also our spaces of love, attachment, uh, nourishment, uh, affect, where we draw uh, particular uh, resources of uh, support. So how you uh, sort of reorganize those spaces and those logics is the ongoing work of building those registers for communicative equality, you know? Uh, so I love the work that talks about radical love, like how do we, uh, through love, build registers for equality and make equality so vital uh, that it becomes um, uh, ways of reorganizing our most intimate of spaces. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And we have another question. It's Marvis' question, I think. Uh, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was great. Uh, my question is about uh, self-censorship. Uh, what do you think about self-censorship in academia? Uh, is it something that uh, authority imposes on us? Uh, and also, what is the effect of uh, political correctness on uh, self-censorship in academia, and does it create an intellectual and oppressive environment? Thank you, Marve. That's a great question. Um, you see, authoritarian pedagogy, uh, the ways of uh, teaching and learning in authoritarianism works through teaching of self-censorship. In fact, self-censorship is the way in which we learn to survive, in which most academics learn to survive. So you see this certainly in Singapore. So in the midst of mm, the worst of sexual violence um, on university campuses, uh, uh, almost most professors don't speak up um, because uh, they have learned to self-censor and they talk about it in the language of what is called outer bound markers, which is similar to the idea of political correctness, which is what you can and cannot talk about. And we learn then uh, these strategies of survival through techniques of pedagogy about what is it that we need to do in order to survive the system. So within that backdrop, then, Marve, you know, the question I often ask in my work is that how can we teach and teach ourselves the strategies for questioning the limits of what we can and cannot talk about? And how do we uh, build registers for e uh, equality so that we can, in fact, create uh, different rules for participation and communication about what we can and cannot talk about? Because usually what we can and cannot talk about are established by those in power, you know? Um, uh, and, and even in terms of how we can talk about it. So part of that uh, work of communicative equality is actually changing the definitional terrains. So changing the terrain in terms of who gets to uh, set up the rules about what is civility, what is correctness, uh, for what purposes, and then opening up that space on an ongoing basis so that we can have multiple conversations uh, based upon multiple anchors. Thank you for your answer. I think uh, we have the last question we have. It's Bahriye Shevai's question. Hello, my question uh, includes a quotation from Mr. Blue. After our re rector, Melip Blue was appointed. He said that one of the areas that I will emphasize is the commercial commercialization of not only our students, but also our faculty members' knowledge production. 
I will do my best to promote an environment, environment supporting both large startups. However, as far uh, as far as I understand, this commercialized co knowledge contains mostly engineering or science departments that can give outputs that can be converted to money. As a literature student, I wonder the position of literature departments in a university driven by, by neoliberal policies. Thank you. Barrier, what a great question. And that uh, quotation is a perfect example, right? Where uh, the logic of commercialization and privatization is actually what is projected as good for the university. So of course, it is natural to be able to have to commercialize and to promote startups. And you're seeing this across university spaces where universities have designated areas for startups, right? And uh, this is where, you know, one of the things that we know is that the US as the producer of uh, many of these ideas is not the Mecca of democracy, uh, because it has actually produced these kinds of fundamental imperial ideas in the uh, service of neoliberal capital and made them uh, normal and normalize them such that every university across the globe uh, aspires to commercialize and privatize and have just like you're saying, um, uh, uh, an entrepreneurship section um, that actually builds the uh, engineering and growth capacities of the nation. So that's how uh, these are projected. And at the same time, like you're saying, uh, the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and especially those uh, elements of the arts, humanities, and social sciences that don't lend themselves to the corporatization and the commoditization and the privatization are framed as unnecessary, as vestigial, and as, um, um, in fact, um, a remnants of a past era. So you're seeing a global restructuring happening across universities where arts and literature departments, humanities departments, uh, social science departments that have been uh, labeled as impractical because they don't serve the logics of the market have been dismantled. Uh, they have been uh, taken apart entirely and universities have been reorganized under the narrative of driving economic growth. So. Um, the, the question for us is that we all know that this is happening and we see this is happening. So the question is, how do we resist it? How do we challenge it? And for that resistance and challenge uh, to happen, of course, that um, organizing work within universities um, uh, on an ongoing basis, you know, challenge the narratives. But it also needs to connect with the struggles of the working classes, uh, the struggles of people outside the university, the struggles of communities that are um, negotiating with and living with the effects of these uh, neoliberal policies. So in that sense, uh, building many registers of solidarity and solidarity outside is really important because we really fundamentally need to change the language, the meanings through which we engage these uh, neoliberal forces of authoritarian transformation. So uh, the kinds of things that you're seeing with the precarization of the university and the foregrounding of privatizing logics in the academe are also the kinds of things that the working classes are facing with uh, limitations of their capacity to organize with ideas such as automation and digitization being placed on them with many workers uh, losing their work and their sources of income. You start with attacks on unions so that, um, and again, that is often carried out through the same logic that we can drive, we can be the engines of economic growth only if we dismantle the unions. So uh, if, when we connect with those struggles across multiple registers, we start building ways of um, uh, challenging these forces of privatization. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we wanted to finish this uh, open lecture, but we have a question from uh, our, one of our listeners. Uh, can I ask it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Kibra, uh, if you can ask it, I think. Um, uh, sorry, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, good. Um, first, of, thank you. <laughs> it's such such a beautiful open class. And uh, our last question uh, we had reached is that 
Recently, lots of cameras were placed on our campuses in the name of students and scholars' security. How should one react, react against these types of camouflaged uh, authoritarian acts? Also, uh, how can we identify an act as an authoritarian act? Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's really powerful that you're noticing that this is happening on your campuses now. Uh, authoritarian regimes like Singapore uh, have long done this practice. So if you uh, walk in Singapore, you will see that almost every street lamp has a camera that is uh, installed on the street lamp. And on the university campuses, um, almost every alley walkway building has cameras built into every layer. And these are of course uh, strategies of surveillance under uh, uh, the notion of security. Remember how I talked about uh, securitization and surveillance, right? So the narrative of security works precisely to enable those strategies of uh, surveillance. The way you challenge that is by, uh, challenging the discourse of security. So if for instance, you know, uh, the, the language is that, oh, you know, uh, we need to have greater security because there is, this is a way to prevent sexual violence on uh, campuses. Uh, that, is, uh, that can be used as a logic. And uh, then it is important to point out to all the evidence uh, that suggests that it is not the installment of cameras that stop sexual violence, but actually, having uh, infrastructures for voice like a, a sexual harassment cell or a, a, or a structure to address sexual violence that actually prevents and uh, offers remedies to sexual violence. In fact, Singapore has cameras everywhere uh, on academic campuses and still its universities have uh, some of the largest incidences of sexual violence that have only started being disclosed now that had been long hidden. So uh, that gives away the um, uh, irony of the argument that you install cameras to produce security. And the question worth asking is security for whom? Security for whose purposes? And who feels secure with the installment of uh, cameras? Is it um, the students and the staff who feel secure? Or is it the university administration that feels secure because they can control now the spaces of um, uh, dissent? The broader point I want to make, if you look at this phenomenon of install, installing cameras, is that the next layer of it and connecting to platform capitalism and digital platform is the incorporation of technologies like face recognition um, and the big data that are connected with the cameras. So um, increasingly sort of the frontiers of authoritarian um, uh, uh, management like Singapore have built in technologies where cameras can uh, recognize faces and connect you immediately to a database. So uh, you, if you think about um, automation, uh, uh, you know, big databases uh, that are connecting and securitizing this information. Another question to ask is, um, uh, are, what are the kinds of data these cameras are collecting? How are these data being stored? And um, how are these data then being deployed and for what purposes? And certainly, you know, platforms like Facebook, as you are well aware, have used these kinds of uh, uh, face recognition techniques in order to inform lawmakers or um, in order to support lawmakers in their uh, work of repressing, repressing dissent, you know. Uh, so uh, being aware of that, also it's important to think about strategies of resistance, like how do you become invisible? How do you uh, render yourself illegible to the camera? or to the surveillance devices? What do you do so that the surveillance devices cannot read you? Uh, what kinds of strategies can you put into place to be invisible while protesting? And I think uh, you see um, uh, many creative examples of that, for instance, in Hong Kong with the student protests in Hong Kong um, and um, uh, sort of in, in terms of building mass bases and uh, large collective solidarities. And I think uh, it's really important to think through those kinds of creative responses. 
thank you for all of your uh, kind answers. I think we can finalize our open lecture here. And if it's okay, we want to take a picture as a remembrance. Can, can we do that? Okay. Okay, Smile. I can thank you. Take a screenshot now. Uh, okay, I did it. Thank you. Thank you all of you for being here and listening. Mohandut was great. Uh, open lecture and lastly, thank you for you, dear Professor Dutta, for being here and accepting our invitation again. Uh, we are ended up here and you can follow. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, would you send me the picture? I would love to um, have it as memory. I just want to say, you know, wrap up by saying in solidarity, um, solidarity always wins. Believe in your power and believe in the power of change. You know, if the uh, uh, most uh, repressive of authoritarian regimes and neoliberal forces can be dismantled. Believe in that. And you inspire, I, so thank you. I'm sorry, can I take one more? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, no, I think it's okay now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.